Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, we're ready to begin another uh, City Club Friday Forum. I'm Doug Marker, President-elect of City Club. Welcome. I'm filling in for Corlene Kraft today. Uh, just as a reminder, if you wouldn't mind, please turning off your cell phones and your pagers uh, so that we don't interrupt our speaker. Have a few announcements to run through, and then um, I'll introduce today's speaker. Um, next Friday's forum um, is a very important one. We're calling it Pay Dirt or Pay Back, Land Use After Measure 37, with Ross Day from Oregonians in Action, Lane Shetterly from Oregon's Department of Land Conservation and Development, and Bob Stacy of Thousand Friends of Oregon to discuss the outcome of Ballot Measure 37 and um, what the legislature and the courts may do with it. So that'll be a very interesting uh, discussion. I hope you can be here for that. The City Club and Multnomah County Citizen Involvement Committee are sponsoring six community strategy forums during the month of February. And they'll be putting the methods of today's speaker, Peter Hutchinson, um, into practice through looking at six specific objectives of the county's budget. Uh, these will be a series of evening meetings, and the schedule is too lengthy to run through here, but they're in our bulletin and on the website. Uh, in, if you picked up this week's bulletin um, in the back, or you'll be receiving it in the mail, you'll see that an important new City Club long-term study on the Portland Development Commission is now out on the street, and we'll be um, voting on that in two weeks. We're going to try a new way of allowing club members to discuss the content of the report and its recommendations, and that is to have an evening program at our new headquarters, the City Club Commons on 9th and Washington, um, on the evening of Wednesday, January 26th, beginning at 5.15. Members are invited to come and discuss the report and its recommendations in preparation for the vote. We'll be having a, another City Club Reads program on January 31st, at, again at the City Club comment, Commons. I keep on wanting to say comments. Um, and that is uh, to look at um, David Brooks's book, Bobos in Paradise. And I believe we have copies for sale in the back. Um, details on all these events, as always, are in our bulletin and on the City Club's website, www.pdxcityclub.org. And audio CDs and videotapes of today's uh, program will be available, and you can locate those on our website as well. Our sponsors this quarter are Nike Incorporated, Portland General Electric, Preston Gates, and Ellis LLP. Would you join me, please, in thanking our sponsors? So today's program is uh, called The Price of Government getting the results we need in an age of permanent fiscal crisis. And I appreciate putting the label permanent on it because as an Oregonian, it does feel like we're in a permanent fiscal crisis. I see many of our local officials here to hear our talk uh, from Peter Hutchinson. Peter um, was formerly an executive with the Target Corporation in Minnesota, and he became uh, Minnesota's Commissioner of Finance, where he introduced several uh, innovations in um, public budget management. He also served as uh, the superintendent of schools in Minneapolis. Uh, currently, Peter is the founder and president of the Public Strategies Group, working with um, state and local governments on their budgeting strategies. And in the course of that, he's worked with clients in Iowa, Minnesota, and the state of Washington, where he confronted a $2.5 billion, he was quick to assure me it's billion, <laughs> dollar shortfall in that state's budget. And in the course of that work, he developed strategies that he's now um, put together in um, his book. Uh, when he, uh, actually, I'm drawing a blank on the title of the book, but he will tell us. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. <laughs> but a book with um, David Osborne, who um, authored the bestseller Reinventing Government. I did remember David's book. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> that's OK. <laughs> but these are strategies to encourage local governments and state governments to look at how they perform their budget and introduce new strategy in a time of permanent fiscal crisis. So with that, I'll turn it over to our speaker, Peter Hutchinson. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doug. It's a real, real pleasure for me to be here. Um, when I was a school superintendent, I started what has become a 15-year project of trying to keep track of the lessons that I learn as I kind of stumble my way through life. And one of the most powerful I learned 
here in Oregon. It was a summer, uh, while I was, actually while I was superintendent, we were out here on a family vacation and uh, my wife's cousin lives in Eugene and he said, oh, let's go camping. Let's go up by Three Sisters. We'll go camping and we'll have a great family experience, which was perfect. We have two little kids, they had two little kids, so off we went. And he found us the most fabulous place to camp. I have no idea where it is. I know I could never find it again. But what I remember about it is this wonderful trout stream that was just sort of meandering by the tents and the beauty of Oregon, which was really out in full force that particular day. We had two four-person tents. Uh, they had one, we had the other. We kind of settled in. We had a wonderful dinner, built a big campfire, uh, made popcorn over the campfire. Our kids thought we were about the coolest parents in the world. And, the, and of course, the sun goes down. Now, we're city folks, and it's really important to get a sense of how dark it gets when the sun goes down. It was really dark. I mean, like, dark, dark. But not to worry, it's time to go to bed anyway. So we climb into our tents, and like four little logs, we're lined up. One, my youngest daughter is the furthest in, and then my wife, then my oldest daughter, and I'm right by the door. You know, I'm the protector of the family. And, and we fall asleep. And I have no idea what time it was, because it was so dark. But at some point in the middle of our, of our otherwise restful sleep, my oldest daughter rolls over and says those words that strike terror in the heart of every adult human being. Oh, Mom, I don't think I feel so well. At which point she sat up and vomited all over. The whole, everybody is just, you know, thrown into a tizzy. She's screaming and scared and sick and, I mean, just all these terrible things are happening and it's so dark. And we're racing around, fixing, you know, cleaning things up, trying to calm her down. Emily, it'll be all right. It'll be, don't worry, everything's all right. We clean things up. We, we're trying to be quiet. We get everything cleaned up, and everyone goes back to bed, and we go back to sleep. It's okay. Everything's just fine. And when the morning came, we learned one of the most important lessons of life. When you're in the dark, things look a lot better than they really are. <laughs> That's how I feel about budgeting. What I want to try to convince you about today is that the approach that we've been taking in public budgeting for the last roughly 50 or 60 years has left us virtually in the dark and has made it almost impossible for us to confront the permanent fiscal uh, condition, actually crisis, that we face, and that there is a better alternative. And with any luck, if my voice doesn't give out, uh, I will succeed in, in trying to show you how the system we use for all these years is holding us back, keeping us in the dark, and then give you a sense of what could be. Generally, the, the four themes I want to develop today are that government is broke permanently and broken at least temporarily, and we got to do something about that. It's broken in the sense that it's losing the competition for public support and has been losing it for years and years. Secondly, that we can get a lot more results from our budget, but not the way we're currently doing it. Thirdly, that success is possible. And finally, that leadership is the key resource that makes the difference between the old and the new. By leadership, I want to distinguish between balancing the budget. That's a management chore. Anybody in this room can balance a budget. It's all addition and subtraction, mostly subtraction. It's, the numbers are not nearly as complicated as they sound. Balancing the budget is not our challenge. The leadership challenge we face is delivering more and better services to our citizens at the price the citizens are willing to pay. That's how we get out of the conundrum of being broken and broke. It's not a surprise to people in Oregon that government is broke. It's sort of a condition. But I, I want to suggest for just a second that we ought to get used to it, because this condition is not going to go away for some very simple and important reasons. First, the federal government. If any of you are waiting for the federal government to help solve the financial problems that you face in Oregon, fine. Uh, but it ain't going to happen. And it's not going to happen not for political reasons, 
It's going to happen for very fundamental financial reasons. In the next 20 to 25 years, if nothing else changes in the federal government, which is the best prediction you can make about the federal government, the entire budget of the United States will be consumed in four appropriations. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and interest on the debt. They will consume every dollar that the federal government collects in 20 to 25 years from now. Now you're saying that's an awful long time, a lot could change. Well, I just want you to get a sense of how long 20 to 25 years is. 24 years ago, we inaugurated Ronald Reagan as president. You can all remember it. 20 years from now, 24 years from now is not that far away. I'll still be here, I promise you. And my children will be at their peak earning years, and they better be. Because <laughs> they're gonna have to pay for this. Now, why is that happening at the federal level? It's very straightforward. The costs for health care for retirees are going to mount tremendously as we baby boomers begin our, our whatever we're going to, our saga of retirement. And the numbers are overwhelming. In fact, I'm, I'm amazed at how much attention we're paying to Social Security because of the four things that are going to consume most of the federal budget, Medicare is the one that's going to bankrupt the country. It's not Social Security, it's not Medicaid, and it's not interest on the debt. But the four together make it almost impossible. Can I get my heart? But the worst thing, and the same thing is true for, for the state budget. If you look at your state budget, the cost to uh, uh, mostly to deal with uh, Medicaid, with uh, coming pensions and, and the requirements with retirement and so on are crowding things out in the state budget as well. And all of those things cascade back to the county and the city and the school districts who all feel uh, as though they're broke. Why will this condition not go away? It's very simple. It's, it's, it's almost as though there were a perfect storm brewing and it has finally come to pass. This perfect storm is the collision of two uh, kind of big fiscal fronts that are, that are confronting us. On the one hand, we do have the, the inevitable costs for education, incarceration and medication, which consume 80 to 85 percent of every budget. And those costs are rising at a rate that is much faster than the rate of inflation. Secondly, we have the coming costs for pension and health care, especially for retirees. Those are obligations due. They, are, they already exist. We're just going to have to find the money to pay them. And in municipalities and counties and even states across this country, those obligations are unfunded, which means they're just sitting there ticking away, waiting to, to, uh, to thunder us into fiscal calamity. And finally, we have rising debt and debt service. In almost every jurisdiction, the obligations that we've made for the future are stacking on top of one another. That's the one front, the, the rising cost of almost everything we're trying to do in the public sector. And the other front is the inability of the public sector to uh, provide sufficient revenue to cover all those costs. You see, the citizens are not willing to raise the price of government. They like the price of government just as it is. And they're, they're resistant, as you know, uh, to changing that. I'm going to say a word in just a second about why that is. But in terms of our perfect storm, that's the setup. We have a, basically a fixed price of government coming up against a, a rising set of costs for government. And it's not going to end. My advice to my friends in government has been the same for five years now. Get used to it. This is what a recovered uh, fiscal situation feels like right now. This is as good as it gets. Always short, always struggling, always trying to figure out how to solve the math problem of balancing the budget and never quite getting to the leadership solution. And you know, as bad as that is, it's not the worst thing the government faces today. The worst thing is the fundamental citizenism of the citizens we're trying to serve. In poll after poll, you can see how the public mood has changed over the last 20 years. From a time when we actually thought government was there to make our lives better, to a time now when citizens are increasingly skeptical of what we do and how we do it. I have never seen more negative polling coming out uh, from our citizens as I've seen in the last two years. And it's very troubling for those of us who recognize that if we didn't have government, we'd have to invent it. We have to have it. But Citizen after citizen is saying, even though I know that, I don't trust 
the governments we've got to deliver what we need and to do it responsibly in terms of the managing of, of our finances. Even here in Oregon, you know from your own experience that when citizens are given a choice, they're more likely to resist the temptation to give to government more opportunity, responsibility, and resources because they're increasingly skeptical about what government will do. They've come to believe that we collect taxes from them so we can pay our costs. They believe that because that's what we say all the time. Our, we're, we need more here, we, need more we have more costs here, we need more money, we have more costs here, we need more money. They think this is all about taking their money to pay our costs. And they don't give us money to pay our costs, they give us money to get results. They want services, they want outcomes, they want it to work. And they don't understand why it can't work. And because the condition is permanent, we feed the cynicism when at the end of each one of our budget cycles we say, guess what folks, we balanced the budget. And within two months, three months, four months, we've, we're short again. We've got another shortfall, we've got to rebalance the budget. They don't get, they don't understand why it is we can't keep our budgets in line when they have to keep their budget in line. The challenge we face fundamentally is to win back public support and we can only do that, in my estimation, if we demonstrate to the public that we can deliver on their expectations for service at the price they're willing to pay. And that gets us to how we approach the fundamental financial management in our organizations. You know, Albert Einstein once said that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Fundamentally, that's what we've been doing in public sector budgeting. Every year we come in and go through the same process over and over and each year we begin believing something different is going to happen by the time we're done. But it doesn't happen. It's because of the way the game is set up. Let me describe the rules of the game for just a second. We begin in the, in the traditional approach to budgeting by asking departments and agencies, how much do you need to keep doing what you've always been doing and the way you've always done it with the results you've already, always gotten? Now that's a great question, and what you get back is, I need more. I need more because of inflation. I need more because there's more people to serve. I need more because it's more complicated. I need more because I'm good and I deserve more. And th those are the kind of budget proposals that come forward. They're, they're not ill-intentioned, they're well-intentioned. These are people who struggle hard to deliver what the public is interested in. But when asked the question, how much do you need, the answer is always going to be more. And those mores stack up. As I like to say, when you budget for costs, you always get more of them. They come in with a vengeance, and they inevitably exceed the revenues available by, I remember one time, 100%. And then the struggle is what to cut. And the budget game that we go through is we, it's, it's kind of like hide and go seek. You don't want to get tagged. If, you, if you're the agency that's making this proposal, you want to make it as safe as you possibly can. The, the best metaphor I've ever been able to come up with to understand what it is that it feels like when these budget proposals come in is spam in a can. Some of you are old enough to remember the real spam before there was the internet. Came, comes in a little can about that big. It's made in Austin, Minnesota. It's a food product. Well, it's alleged to be a food product. How many of you remember Spam? How many of you taken Spam out of the can? I can see by the look on your faces you know what I mean. Spam is covered with a gelatinous material. A disgusting gelatinous material. Something you don't want to touch. Well, that's the challenge for finance people when they get these budget submissions. We know there's something in there, but we can't get through the gelatinous material to find out what it is. I had a friend, a very good friend, one of my colleagues, who, who actually was a master at getting spam in his can when he made his presentation to the legislature every year, and here's what he did. He ran the administrative services for the state, which is all the technology and the telephones and the purchasing, and he always wanted to get more technology investments, which are very expensive. Now, the way to get the technology investments through the legislature is to never let the legislature discuss them. So what he always did in his budget submission 
is he put right before the appropriation or the recommendation for the technology, he would put the recommendation for the uniforms for the state band. I mean, you can't believe how controversial the uniforms for the state band are. What should the buttons be brass or not brass? Should there be epaulets? Should there be stripes? You can consume, you know, 90 minutes, 120 minutes, a few hours debating the whole, this is his gelatinous material. They never got to the technology. They just passed it through. That's how he got his budget through his organization, through our, through our state legislature, actually. That's the struggle with the game that has always been played. We, we make it an all cuts all the time process. We focus only on costs, but never on results. And we actually create incentives for people to try to play hide and go seek. And then we discover that it, this, is, this is what makes this so hard. If you're on the receiving end of these proposals, your job is to figure out what to cut. And you all know that as soon as you make a recommendation to cut something, there's somebody going to pop up and tell you how wrong you are. And if you make five recommendations, there's five somebodies. You're going to get blamed. You're going to get uh, singled out as being the villain in this act. And I remember so clearly how I was always the villain. And the agencies that packing all this stuff in the spam, they're the heroes. At the end of this process, Everybody's getting blamed and everybody feels terrible. And, and so we don't want to do cuts. So then, because we don't want to do cutting, we go to the deadly deceptions, the fiscal illusions. Now, I'll just mention six. Just to ask yourself, has this ever happened in your state? First, we steal money from one account to put in another account. We call this transferring. It seems so innocuous, but the, we put money in the first account for a reason, and it happens to be there for some purpose. But because we need it to balance the budget, we just make that little transfer, and somehow, magically, we're better off. The second big illusion is we lie in our accounting about how things actually work. I know this would never happen here, but in some places, well, I actually did this. Uh, we would say, for example, that if we have an aid payment due to our school districts in July, I mean in May, we would pay it in July, because that moves it across the fiscal year. So all of a sudden, our expense has gone down. Aren't we bright? Or the reverse was always true. We tell the, the, uh, the, uh, the retailers, we have a sales tax where I live, we tell the retailers that if you owe us money for your June receipts in July, just pay it in June. Just make an estimate and send them money. That increases the revenue in one fiscal year. All of a sudden, our budget is balanced. Congressman Bill Frenzel says, you know, when Enron did all this, we tried to put him in jail. But in the public sector, we call it good management. Or we borrow. Uh, you're not too far away from the world record uh, borrowing state in the union. California has now, now broken the world record for uh, state government borrowing. $15 billion uh, that, that was borrowed, and they, and they threw that guy out of office. They brought the new guy in. He borrowed $14 billion, said he would never do it again, just proposed to borrow $6 billion. California is going to borrow themselves into the largest uh, debt hole in the history of mankind, and it's not at all clear to anyone how they're going to get out of it. But we borrow in other ways. We borrow when we defer maintenance. We're actually stealing money from the future when we defer fundamental maintenance on our infrastructure or our buildings, but we do it all the time. We pretend as though it's free, and it's never free. Some poor schlump comes along, and they have to pay for it. I'm particularly sensitive to this because when I was school superintendent, on the first day of my job, Someone comes in and says, we have $350 million of deferred maintenance. And I said, what does that mean? And they said, well, the ceilings are falling down in the schools. And we had to find the money. We didn't make that decision. Those people before us made that. They stole that money from us. Deferring uh, things that we ought to be doing is just borrowing by another name. Or we use reserves and sell off assets. Uh, these are one-time uh, deals that we do, to, again, to make the math problem come out. The classic in this is the state of Illinois. Illinois has a wonderful state office building in downtown Chicago, one of the more interesting state office buildings I've ever seen. It's called the Thompson State Office Building. But they had a huge budget problem. And so they decided that the smart thing to do is to sell the building, take the cash, and put it in the budget. So they announced they're selling the Thompson office building. And the next day, they announced the asking price. And they booked the revenue. So this is a threefer. You know, they're making something up. They're, they're doing this one-time deal, and then they're transferring money they don't actually have. And to my knowledge, they've never actually sold the building, but the budget's balanced. And that's, that's the last of the illusions, is the making something up stuff. We do this all the time, too. The, 
the genius that uh, showed us how to do this was, uh, was Stockman, David Stockman, who was Ronald Reagan's OMB director. Remember the famous rosy scenario? They knew the economy was going in the tank, so they forecast a 2.5% growth in GNP in order to justify their revenue projection, which they knew was made up. And then they produced the largest deficits in the history of the world. And then finally, when we can't do any of those things anymore, we resort to across-the-board cuts, as though every program were equally inefficient or equally useless or equally useful, as though we, could, we can keep thinning the soup every year and no one will notice. But people do notice. What happens when we practice these fiscal illusions is the same thing that happens when we play the old budget game. When we're all done, we have solved the math problem, but we have lost the leadership competition. All these things we do come back to haunt us. They don't go away. They don't move to another state or the county next door. They're sitting right there waiting for us, or if we're really lucky, waiting for our successors who will be forced to deal with it. This old game is a game for losers. It asks the wrong questions, it gets the wrong answers, and it doesn't take us anywhere that we want to go. I want to suggest a different approach to budgeting that starts with four completely different questions. These are going to seem uh, amazingly simple, but I, I, I want you to appreciate how different they are from the questions we've been asking. We've been asking how much do you need to keep doing what you've always been doing in the way you've always been doing it and getting the same results. That's the traditional question. In budgeting for outcomes, which is the name we've attached to this stuff, we start by asking how much revenue are we going to have? What is the price of government that our citizens are willing to pay? Secondly, we ask what are the results that citizens actually want from their government? We call these the priorities of government. What are the results? Not the cost codes or the, or the agencies or the departments or any of that. What are the results? What do they expect government to deliver? The third question is how much are we willing to pay for each one of those results? How much is each result worth? And then finally, what's the best way, given the price that citizens are willing to pay, to deliver that result to them? Four completely different questions in which, by the way, the word cost never appears, and the word last year never appears. We don't ask in, in this different design about what people have always done we ask about how we can do for citizens that which they expect. This means that we end up treating the uh, proposals that we get from agencies and departments as though they were offers, not budget requests, but offers, an offer to produce a specific outcome at a specific price in a specific period of time. It's a completely different mindset. And we look at each one of the offers we look at each one of the offers in the context of the results we're trying to deliver. So we can weigh whether one offer is going to get us further toward that result than another. We can actually judge the relative importance of these offers to producing the outcomes that we want. We buy the offers that make the most sense and leave the rest behind. We end up with a balanced budget, but more importantly, we end up with a budget that delivers outcomes that citizens really care about at the price they're willing to pay. In our lingo, we deliver the priorities of government at the price. Now this approach has been, has been tried now many times. It started in the state of Washington in 2002. Uh, where the governor there had a two and a half billion dollar problem and 11 weeks to solve it. And he called us up and said, you got any ideas? And we basically said, yeah, we have an unreasonable suggestion. Let's not do it the way we've always done it. And that, that staff, that budget staff and the agency folks did heroic work to recreate a $26 billion budget in 11 weeks that tried to answer these two questions. The state of Iowa has just finished their first budget using this design. The state of the governor of California has just presented his first budget using this design. Uh, your governor has presented a budget that builds on these ideas, doesn't quite go as far as some of these other states, but is a wonderful beginning. And interestingly enough, the legislature in the state of Michigan is choosing to use this as the way to deal with the budget they expect to get from the governor. So this is one of the more interesting uh, spins on this from my point of view. The tradition is the governor proposes and the legislature is left trying to figure it out. This time the legislature is saying, send us whatever you want, we're going to look at it this way. So you can create the budget using the old tools, but we're going to analyze the budget using some new tools. The city of Los Angeles used this design a couple of years ago, the city of Spokane, uh, Snohomish County, which is Everett, Washington, and now Multnomah County uh, here 
is fully engaged in this process, up to their hips at least. And with great vigor, I might add, I mean, I've, we do a lot of this work with a lot of jurisdictions, and this is a parenthetical. I mean, what we observe is the uh, commitment and passion of public employees to do what's right for citizens. And you should know that that commitment and passion is, al is alive and well in Multnomah County, and they're doing a heck of a job. Uh, we're not done. We're not at the end. Uh, so I don't want them or you to think that we're resting on our oars. Uh, but they're, they've gone after this with the kind of passion that it takes to succeed. What I'd like to do in the next few minutes is just take each of the steps of this process and give you a flavor for the kind of work that it takes to get this done. Let me start with this phrase that I've now used twice, the price of government. What do we mean by that? I don't, I'm not talking about the cost of government. It's the price. The price is the sum of all the taxes, all the fees, all the fines, all the parking thing, all the tolls, all the licenses, everything we pay to government. That's the price of government. And we express it as a percentage of personal income. So if you add up all the taxes, all the fees, all the charges, everything from all the governments, and divide it by the income of all the people, it's a way of expressing what, how many cents for every dollar, what percentage of our income is being turned over to government. It turns out to be a very interesting measure because I was told, when I, when I actually discovered this in 1990 when I was working for the governor of Minnesota, I was told relentlessly uh, by conservatives in our community that the price of government was out of control. And you've got to stop that. Uh, while, at, while at the same time, the liberals in our community were saying, we're not spending enough. Feel familiar? Let me tell you about the price of government. In the United States, if you look at all governments for the last 53 years, you add up all the taxes, fees, and charges paid to the federal government, all the states, all the cities, counties, school districts, the mosquito control districts in Minnesota, everybody, and divide it by personal income, over the last 53 years, it's been 36 cents. 36 cents. Yes, some years it's been 37 or maybe as high as 38, 38 and a half. Some years it's been as low as, oh, 35, 34 and a half. If you looked at this graph, it looks like a thermostat. It looks like it's trying to regulate the temperature. And what's actually happening is we're regulating how much we spend for government. We're regulating the price of government. Now, this is going to come as a complete surprise to folks, because we are, we are convinced depending on what our ideological stance is, that the price is rising inexorably or crashing into the ground. And neither of those two things are true. The people of this country, through their behavior, have chosen a price for their governments. And it's 36 cents. It's not, it's not 42, it's not 27, it's 36. Plus or minus a little bit. And if we know that the price is set, then the challenge for us is to figure out how to deliver what citizens want at the price they're willing to pay. Well, you might ask, well, why isn't it 42 or 27, or how does it work? Well, there's a very important concept that we have to keep in mind. When we say 36 cents on the dollar, when we say 36% of the aggregate income of all the people, it means that the folks are trying to figure out how to use their 100%. Now, they got a few things to do with the other 64. They got to have a house. They got to get around. They got to educate and got to raise and educate their kids. They got to have food and clothing. They've got to have recreation. They got to put some money in the bank if they're lucky. So what is, is in essence going on is our citizens are trying to make a set of choices among competing demands. And they make these choices based on their perception of the value that they get in return for the price that they pay. And what they're doing what you are doing when you're citizens is you're challenging the housing sector and the transportation sector and the entertainment sector and the food sector and the clothing sector and the banking sector and the government to deliver more and more value every year at whatever price we're willing to pay. And here's the thing. We're unbelievably unreasonable about this. We don't actually care how much uh, Apple computer thinks it costs to make a computer. All we care about is the price-value relationship. I, my, my story is very simple. I'm on my seventh computer in 20 years. The last one I bought cost $1,200. The first one I bought 
cost $1,200. The, the last one I bought is 100,000 times more powerful than the first one. What do you think I expect from the next one? And it's just as true in housing. Housing today consumes the exact same share of personal income as it did in 1950, yet the houses are 50% larger, have three times as many bathrooms, and two-thirds as many people living in them. I don't know what you all are doing with all those bathrooms with fewer people. It's up to you. But we're getting a lot more house for our money or transportation. Our cars today are supremely better than the cars that existed 20 years ago, and yet, as a share of personal income, we're actually spending less on transportation than we used to. Same for food and clothing. Both of those have gone down relative to personal income. What's taken up the slack? Well, you already know. It's health care. The share of our personal income that's gone to health care has doubled in the last 30 years, and it doesn't show any signs of abating. So the, the message here is, we don't get to pick the price of government. Our citizens are picking it. And they're enforcing it on us every day, every year, every decade. And at least for the last five decades, they've settled on 36 cents overall. Now, the same is true in your state. The price of government in Oregon, if you add up all the taxes, fees, and charges paid by all the governments in Oregon, the citizens in Oregon, to all the governments in Oregon, as a share of all the personal income, Oregon has, has historically been about one cent higher than the national average. Just about one cent higher. Right now, the national average is about 15 percent, and Oregon would have been at about 16 percent. Historically, that's where you've been. I come from a state that's even a higher price state. We're about a 16 and a half percent state. New York's a 17 percent state. New Hampshire's a 14 cent state. There is no one price that fits in every place. There's a different price for every community. But there is a price. And it's being sorted out as citizens, elected officials, make all those thousands and millions of decisions that go in to choosing how much to pay for their government. I say this at the beginning of this because I know how much energy I and others have put into arguing about whether taxes should go up or should go down. And my smart-ass remark about this is, stop. The price has been decided. If you want to debate taxes, it's, it's only a question of how we collect the price. It's not about changing it. Citizens know how much they're willing to spend. Our job is to figure out how to spend it well. That goes to step two. We ought to spend the price of government on the, on the results that citizens want. What's so exciting about this work for me is to actually sit in rooms with randomly selected citizens and ask the following question. What results do you want from your government? What's so wonderful about it is they know the answer. And I've got to tell you a secret. It's not cost codes. It's not program names. They don't even know how the heck we're organized. You know, what they know is they want their kids to get a good education. They want to be able to get from home to work in a reasonable period of time. They want to feel safe in their community. They want people to be healthy. They want the economy to grow, and they want the government to be accountable. We've done hundreds of these focus groups. I keep doing them because I love listening to citizens talk about this stuff, but that's what they talk about. They don't talk about organization structure. They don't talk about the political intrigue of who's after who. They don't talk about the politics of decision making. They just talk about really basic stuff that they want us to deliver. And you know this, you can, you can feel this from the work that's going on right now. Governor Kulingowski, when he put his principles together, what did he talk about? He talked about learning and vulnerable citizens and the business climate and uh, the balance between infrastructure and the environment, safety, and, and a government that was stable, responsive, and accountable. Or here in Multnomah County, in the, in the work that they're doing, they're talking about children learning and the government being accountable and the uh, thriving economy, uh, basic needs being met, safety uh, uh, for citizens and, uh, where they live, work, and play, and clean and healthy neighborhoods. These come from just listening to what citizens have to say. But it goes further than that. Citizens just don't just say, I want my kids to get a good education. They actually talk about how they know whether or not a kid is going to get a good education. They have in their minds measures of success that they use to determine in their minds whether they're getting value for their dollars. 
So when the, in this part of this work, we want to not only identify what are the priorities that citizens hold, but what are the indicators of success that are meaningful to citizens? Because you can't deliver to someone that which they want if you don't know what success looks like to them. So kids that can read and spell and do their math tables and graduate and go to college, that's how citizens think about it. Safety is how they feel. It's their perception when they're walking down the street, as well as the crime rate. It's both. It's not just the crime rate. It's not just how I feel. It's both of these things. When they think about a, a vibrant community, they think about things like the character of neighborhoods, the, the way in which the infrastructure works, the availability of things like libraries and community services. One of the most interesting and most fun for me, not, not in this jurisdiction, this was up in, uh, in uh, Snohomish County, when we asked people, how do you know whether or not the environment is clean, this one woman said, well, if I can see the bridge, from, uh, the bridge deck or the bridge tower from my home, I know it's a clean day. What a wonderful way to express something that we talk about in parts per billion and ozone alerts and all this scientific stuff. In her mind, it's just, can I see the towers on the bridge? So citizens walk around relentlessly desiring these results and knowing how they'll know whether or not we've produced them. One of our jobs in this work is to get that information back so we can use it as the starting point for building our budget. The third step is to figure out how much each one of those results is actually worth. Not how much they cost. You notice we have not gotten the cost word into this conversation yet. What we're interested in is the relative value of these things. You know, they're not all equally valuable to citizens. I can tell you from doing this that education is always the most valuable. It's always 30%, 35, 40% from a citizen's point of view because they're so concerned about the future of their community. Safety is almost always right behind education because it's fundamental. It's a core basic need that citizens experience. And the others are arrayed along a continuum. And when citizens think about that, again, they don't talk about how much it costs to produce education or how much it costs to produce safety. They're just letting us know in their minds the value equation comes out if I have to spend a dollar or a hundred dollars, how would I distribute it? We actually asked this question. That this is how we discover this. We asked citizens, okay, if here's the six priorities or the seven or the eight, you take a hundred dollars and divide it among them. Here in Multnomah County, you had an opportunity, I think you still do, because on the Multnomah County website, they've arrayed their six priorities and there's a little uh, gizmo, I don't know what it's called, some gizmo where you can, you can decide. You, you decide, relatively speaking, how much is each one of these worth. And that's very important to us because not only can we not deliver to citizens that which they wish if we don't know what they want, we also can't put a budget together if we don't know how valuable each of these results are to the people we're trying to serve. It's a judgment, it's not science, but it's a judgment that can be powerfully informed by listening to what citizens tell us. So those first three get us ready. They get us ready to create a very different kind of a budget. Now we know how much we have, the price citizens are willing to pay, and we know the priorities that citizens hold and their relative value. Now we're ready to actually create a budget, but I'm going to call it a purchase plan because budget carries with it that old set of, of activities. Let's think about this as a purchasing activity. What do we want to purchase? We want to purchase the best mechanisms we can to deliver those results to citizens. So in this metaphor, Think of the, the people who are involved as, on the one hand, the buyers, and on the other hand, the sellers. The buyers are the county board, or the city council, or the mayor, or the finance office. These are the people who are going to choose which things to buy. The sellers, well, those would be the departments or agencies. It could be other governmental jurisdictions. It could be nonprofit organizations. In one place where we've done this work, we invited the unions themselves to come in and make offers to, to be part of the selling equation. It could be nonprofits, it could be for profits. It's a choice that we get to make about who can make proposals about how to deliver those results. But before they can make proposals, they have to understand how we think about succeeding at delivering those results to our citizens. So we begin this phase by creating a set of teams for each one of the results a team around safety, a team around education, a team around uh, health or vibrancy. And we ask these teams to do something they've never been asked to do before. This, this is the most important part of this whole thing. We ask them to draw a picture that shows the cause and effect relationships that lead to the outcome. 
What we want to get a sense of is what factors matter most when it comes to creating health, or when it comes to creating safety, or when it comes to creating mobility. Now, we're not asking them to draw a picture of what the government does today. That's not the question. The question is what factors matter most when it comes to producing these things, whether the government's doing them or not. Let me give you a, a two illustrations of this. Uh, first, from the state of Washington. They, uh, they had health. Uh, healthy citizens was one of the uh, priorities they wanted to deliver. So the, the team that worked on this health thing had to answer the question, what factors matter most when it comes to producing health in a population? There's only four. One of them is insurance and care, right? It's access to good quality medical care. That's one of them. By the way, if you only read in the paper and only read the debates about health, you'd think that was the only one. Because we're spending an enormous amount of our time debating whether or not enough people have insurance and the right kind of insurance and on and on and on. But there's three other factors. One of them is how you were born. There's sort of the congenital risk factors that some of us are born with. I'm one of those. I've got congenital high cholesterol. I'm a medical risk. I'm living with it, but I know what I am. I'm a medical risk. So that's one of them. Another one are environmental factors. These we're very familiar with. If the air is clean, we tend, we'll tend to be healthier. If the food in the restaurants and in the stores is clean, if we uh, eliminate the waste regularly, all these kind of environmental factors have a huge effect. Now, they're not such a big deal anymore in our communities because we they're background music. We've taken care of most of those. But the fourth factor, the factor that explains 50% of the variation in the health of a population, the most powerful factor when it comes to determining health is behavior. Behavior. Half of all the people who die in this country die because they didn't behave well. Because they smoked, they drank, and they got fat. Half. Ask ourselves, are we pulling on the levers that are most likely to produce health in the population if we're only pulling on the insurance lever? I think the answer is no. And the whole point of this part of the budgeting process is to try to understand the factors before we understand what we're doing. And to ask the question, are we pulling on the most powerful? Second illustration has to do with transportation. And for this, for our purposes, I'm going to focus just on congestion on the highways. Congestion is the only thing that impedes mobility from point A to point B once, once you're in the car. So what are the factors that create congestion? I got to tell you, I was blindsided by this because I have always thought that congestion was only a function of too many cars on too little road. And therefore, the answer was you either get the cars off the road or make the road bigger. Two very difficult things to pull off. And it turns out I'm dead wrong. There are two primary things that create congestion on our roads. The first is what the transportation people call recurring, uh, recurring congestion, recurring um, uh, impediments. This is road related. A recurring impediment is where uh, the lanes merge or there's a signal that doesn't work right or the, the road is just not wide enough. It's the too many cars on too little road. But that only accounts for half of the congestion. What accounts for the other half? Well, it's non-recurring. Recurring and non-recurring. What's non-recurring? Weather, special events, road construction, but the most important non-recurring cause of congestion is the idiots on the road. It's the guy driving down the road, brushing his teeth, talking on his cell phone, reading the morning paper, who piles into the back of the person in front of him on the highway and backs up 25,000 people for a couple hours in the morning. Now, the problem is those 25,000 people have no idea why they're backed up. They think it's a recurring delay. They think it's too many cars on too little road. They don't know that the real thing is the drivers themselves. And if, if what's so fascinating about this is if you go look at what the FHWA, the highway, Federal Highway Administration, says you should do about this problem, they say you should manage the incidents. Well, that's the, you know, the trucks that go around and try to get people out of the way. They say nothing about preventing them. Nothing. You've got to ask yourself, are we pulling the right levers here? Have, do we have a strategy that actually gets us less congestion, or are we just managing the crappy congestion that we've got? 
That's the point of this part of the process. It's to step back from the day-to-day -day and ask what factors matter most, and then to ask the question, what levers could be most powerful? Here in Multnomah County, we're at that point right now. Next week, the teams that have been working are going to make their presentations to the board about the factors that matter most and the strategies to pursue them. And these are not program descriptions. This is really about of those four factors in health or those two factors in mobility or there's six or seven factors in accountability, which combination of things is likely to get us the most result? When that's done, what happens is that material goes out. Remember, this is the buying team that's doing this work. That material goes out to the sellers, to the department heads, to the agencies, to other governmental units, so they know what kind of proposals we're looking for. Because if we're looking for a proposal that deals with behavior and we're only doing work that deals with managing incidents, they need to know that before they start making their proposals. So the departments and so on have this information and they send their proposals in. They can propose to any of the teams, to any of the results. If, uh, if the sheriff thinks they can do a terrific job at uh, uh, creating both safety and vibrant communities, great. And uh, they, all these proposals come in from whatever source. They get stacked up. And they get ranked according to the result for the money. How much do we get from this proposal versus that proposal from top to bottom? And then the final budget is a function of starting at the top of the list with the money we have. We buy proposal by proposal down the list until we run out. And when we're done, we've got a budget. It fits with the price the citizens were willing to pay and buys those things that will drive us most toward delivering that result successfully. It buys the results we want at the price we're willing to pay. It's balanced by definition because we don't spend money we don't have. It changes the rules. It forces us to think about what to keep, not what to cut. We don't ever ask ourselves if we've done the right or wrong, th whether we need to cut something. It's actually about what do we want to have in the budget. It builds in accountability and it makes sense. What's standing in the way? Well, what do we need in order to be successful? And this is the final thing I want to say. It's about leaders. It's about leadership. The key to success in the county is the leadership that's driving it forward. The key to success uh, with the governor and the governor's beginning work on this is whether he and his administration are willing to take it further. It's all about leadership. So I want to conclude with one story about leadership. When I was a school superintendent, one of the great thrills was visiting classrooms. I'd, there's nothing like being out there with the kids for two reasons. First of all, they're nicer than the adults, and secondly, they're a lot more enthusiastic. And I was out there, and, and the kids uh, were working away, and the teacher said, boys and girls, boys and girls, we have this important visitor in our classroom today, the superintendent of schools. Does anybody know what the superintendent does? Every hand in the room went up. This was a fourth grade. You can ask fourth graders anything. They know it calls on this little guy down in front and he says, yes, ma'am, the superintendent is the guy in charge of Super Nintendo. <laughs> she says, Mike, that was a, that was a good answer, but the, the, the superintendent is the leader of our schools. Does anybody know what a leader does? And way back in that corner, a young girl named Andretta raised her hand so high you just thought it was gonna detach from her shoulder. She stood up and she said the following. A leader is someone who goes out and changes things to make things better. Here's what I want you to remember. That's a fabulous definition of leadership. It's the call for everyone in this room to go out and change things to make things better. And here's the second thing. The fourth graders already know. They want to know whether we know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. And if, again, if you'd like to get involved in Multnomah County's effort to apply uh, some of the strategies that Peter described, um, our, our bulletin and our website list the meetings that will be going on in February for the community strategy forums. Um, now I'll invite uh, questions from the audience. The uh, privilege of the first question goes to our board host, Gwen Milius. Uh, Gwen is a partner with Stuvia and Milius Identity uh, Management, and she's a founder of the City Club's new leadership council. And Peter's agreed to stay uh, 10 minutes or so longer than we normally would to take your questions. So, Gwen? In 
government and public services and also um, now privatized services that I consider um, life and death, like um, healthcare, we often hear that these systems and organizations ought to be run like a business. And so what I'd like to know is, do you have a, a thought on whether these life and death private services and government ought to be run like a business, or are there situations where there may be a quasi-government business model that makes sense, or are we really talking about two different sectors and should keep them separate? Uh, first, I sh my publisher will kill me if I don't do this. There's books available in the back of the room. Um, here's the answer. We shouldn't run anything like a business. If you, if, if, what, what the people of America uh, know about our business uh, is what they know about Enron and Anderson and so on. We shouldn't run anything like that. And I, I really despair of the phrase, run government like a business. I think it's, it's, it creates the wrong metaphor and it, it invites us to do things that are just untenable in the public sector. The big difference between the public and private sectors is the public nature of our public work. We have to make our decisions in front of everyone. We have to be prepared to stand behind those decisions. I, I think the similarity is driving ourselves to deliver as much value for the dollar as we can. But I know from my own experience, the number of private sector folks that have come into government are always stupefied at how different it is to, to lead your entire life in public when they're used to not having to do that. That's not an apology uh, for, the, for the public sector in any sense. Because I f as you know, I feel very strongly we should be making these tough decisions and we should make them in public. And if the public doesn't like it, they'll find somebody else to make them. So it's not an excuse for us to, to have lower standards for the performance in the public sector, but it is dramatically different uh, from what I used to do when I worked at the Dayton Hudson Corporation. We made all of our decisions where no one could see them, and then we call, called you all up and told you what they were. And you had to live with them. Yes, ma'am. Hello, I'm Roberta Palmer, a City Club member. And I'm afraid that the right wing has won the propaganda war against government. And uh, no matter how good you are, you will not get the support you need. But I wonder if you see any hope on the revenue side of the equation. The European countries use the value added tax to bring in tons of revenue. And it seems to have better acceptance, higher uh, compliance than our, our uh, tax system, uh, which has a lot of loopholes. and. Um, does not supply the revenue? The, there are two responses. The first is that the price of government, as I said, I think is set. I don't think we're going to get a lot of new revenue. I think we may change the way we collect it. I think we could do it a lot more effectively with a lot less um, kind of cynicism about how it works. But I don't believe the public sector has a, um, has a call on more revenue until we demonstrate to our citizens that we really can create an awful lot of value for every dollar that we spend. And I know we can. I've seen it happen. I, in, in, just in my own situation, when I was a school superintendent, I had to go and ask our community to put up $258 million. And we were going to lose if we didn't demonstrate that we could produce results. And so we showed them the results first and asked for the money later. And they gave it to us by a you know, five to one margin. I, I don't think that crying uh, poverty on the public, from the public sector is going to win that competition. That's why the conservatives, to the extent that they go on this anti-tax binge, have been succeeding. We need to go on a results for money binge and actually demonstrate that we can do the work. And I think we will do very well. I, I think we will do very well. But we've, we've sort of given the field to the ideologues, and, and they own it right now. We need to get it back. Ray Polanyi, a city club member. Are you saying that the most important thing, really, is to correlate benefit with cost. Oh, sure. Absolutely. In other words, this is what we will deliver if you give us X. Right. Yeah, okay. I think of it as a, like a performance contract, you know? Yeah. We've all lived under performance contracts of one kind or You do this and you get this in return. Yeah. And people want to know, what am I going to get for what I pay? It's very straightforward. Thank you. Uh, Bill Mictum. Uh, I'm having trouble with a few of the things that you said. Um, I'm thinking in particular the price of government. When you talk about, on average, uh, people pay 36%, uh, that ignores 
what individual people at individual right. incomes pay. Absolutely. If Bill Gates walks into the room, we're all on average a whole lot richer. Right. Um, it also ignores the way we collect our taxes or whether we collect our taxes. You, you pointed at California as borrowing a lot, but if the federal government weren't bleeding all of us dry, then we wouldn't be borrowing, and they're doing the biggest borrowing, which you don't Absolutely. mention at all. Absolutely. So uh, my concern is that I'm not sold on, on what you're saying because of these undercurrents. And, and I think that's a perfectly fair critique. We, we've spent no energy trying to explain how we ought to collect the price of government. Maybe that'll be a sequel. We put all our energy into where we believe is the real nub of the issue, which is citizens not seeing the value for their dollar, no matter how the dollar is collected. And the, the truth is, in this country, what's happened over the last 20 years is we haven't been raising general purpose taxes. We've raised fees and fines and, you know, we now in Minnesota, we if a poor person comes in to file a paper in court, they have to pay to file it. I, I think this is outrageous, personally, but because no one has the either the guts or the courage to actually create a better revenue system, we're using a kind of half-assed revenue system to, to patch it together. But when it's all done, the price is still the same. The price is still the same. It, in California is a, a wonderful poster child for this. In 1978, when Proposition 13 passed, the price of government in California went down 24 percent. Twenty-five years later, the price of government in California is exactly what it was when Proposition 13, before Proposition 13 passed. And they didn't pass a single statewide tax to make that happen. They've created the most complex set of local fees and fines and assessments and all kinds of gobbledygook. And I think it's probably unfair, but it's what the citizens ended up having to live with because their leaders couldn't get them to a revenue collection system that made more sense. Ken Ray, City Club member and chair of the County Citizen Involvement Committee. Um.